let's talk about what we can do about power. Now we're going to talk about power in a bunch of different places. The parts we're not really going to talk about are at the process, that's how you build the transistors, and the circuit level, that's how you design the logic. I'm going to give you a few pieces of that now, but that's not where we're going to put our focus. So for the process, well, you can get better semiconductor technology. And this is really the thing that's driven performance. This is, you know, Moore's Law saying things get better. And for an example of this is Intel, when they design their processes now, they optimize for high VT, that is transistors with a high threshold voltage, because they're lower power. They don't focus on the high performance transistors anymore. They focus on how can we make our process work well for low power, and then they have to work harder to get the high performance, but the low power is the important part. So they've changed how they're doing this to focus on lower power rather than high performance. There's also a potential to have different technology. So you may have heard of spintronics or carbon nanotube transistors, lots of other things out there. The problem with these is that semiconductors, CMOS semiconductors are like a hundred billion dollar industry. We have an enormous infrastructure of tools, techniques, education, everything built around them. And for either of these technologies to get take off there, they have to be so much better in a particular way that they can afford the investment to get up to CMOS. So this is going to take a really long time if this is ever going to happen. Circuits are another place where you can do a lot of power optimizations. So you can optimize things more carefully. So these days everyone is mixing these two types of transistors, the high threshold voltage and low threshold voltage. They try to use the high ones everywhere they can to save power and only use the low ones on the critical parts of the circuit where you really need performance. People are always starting to also starting to design for lower frequencies. So Intel in the early 19, sorry, mid early 2000s, their processors were running at over 4 gigahertz. And this meant they had very inefficient pipelines, but they got the high frequencies. Everyone now has shifted down the frequencies. When you shift down the frequencies, it means you need fewer stages, can reduce the pipeline overhead, and you can get better circuits going on. Now the two parts, sorry, the last one here is innovative designs. So we saw an example of how off-chip accesses are very power expensive. They use a lot of power to access DRAM. There are ways you can get around this. So that innovative part there was talking about using serial signaling instead of buses off-chip. This allows you to be much more clever. And the basic trade-off here is that instead of having one transistor sending a signal off the chip, you can use a lot of transistors, but low power transistors, instead of just driving a wire. So if you put together a lot of transistors, you can actually build a little signal processor that monitors the on-chip and off-chip data, so you don't have to put as much power into the wires because you can detect the signals much more easily. So you can be more clever and you can get better power. What we're going to talk about in more detail though is how we can look at the architecture and the runtime and change things there in order to get better power. So let's take a look at power at the architectural level. And there are a few key insights into how we can tackle this, and this is a very active area of research, so tons of papers going on here. Basic ideas are to turn off things we're not using. This is kind of obvious. If you turn off the light in the room when you leave, then you don't have to use power. The idea here is that this will get our frequency to go to zero some of the time, and if we get our frequency to go to zero, we'll reduce all of our dynamic power. We'll still have leakage power. Another way to do this is to trade off latency for parallelism. So if we trade off latency for parallelism, we run at a lower frequency, but we do things in parallel. By running at a lower frequency, we save energy, and we can simplify things. So oftentimes you can get things a lot more efficient by doing sim more simpler things in parallel than by doing fewer things much faster. And simplify is also a big idea here. So reducing the overhead, instead of having a really complicated chip that is focused on doing a few things very quickly when those few things happen, we'll do everything not quite as quickly, but it'll be a much more simple design. And that means fewer transistors, so less power. Let's take a look at a few of these. So the first one here is turning things off, and the big idea here is clock gating. So this is pretty simple. If we're not using something, turn off the clock. If we turn off the clock, there's no data that's going to go in. It's not going to switch any of the transistors, so it won't use any power. An example might be the SIMD unit. So if we don't have any SIMD instructions scheduled, then shut off the pipeline. And we can figure this out easily. So the hardware just looks and sees, is the next instruction a SIMD instruction? And if it's not, it shuts off the clock signal going into the SIMD pipeline. And this will save the dynamic energy in the SIMD pipeline, but not the static, because the transistors are still powered on. But if this is a big thing we're shutting off here, it can take a long time to start it up. And this can actually be a real issue. So you might think, okay, well, SIMD instructions, how much power do they really use? 
Well, they actually use so much power that Intel's Haswell processors reduce the clock speed when you use them. So if you put an AVX2, this is one of these really wide SIMD instructions, into a, a new Intel Haswell processor, it's going to reduce your clock frequency because that, that SIMD instruction uses so much energy that it will heat up the processor too much if you run it at full frequency. So even things like this are really important. And these fine grain clock gating has become an essential feature of things. So really everything that they can possibly shut off when they're not using it, they do. Another example of turning things off is a processor core. If you're not using it, then go ahead and shut down the core. Makes a lot of sense if you've got a lot of processor cores. The problem is it takes a really long time to start it up again. And we can take a look at this. So here's AMD's Bulldozer Dual Core. This area over here, this thing called VSS Gating Footer, this is the transistor that turns off the cores. So this is a massive, huge transistor. Look how big it is. It's you know, big as a quarter of the cache. And turning that transistor on and off, waiting for the voltage to stabilize, waiting for the clocks to stabilize, initializing the processors, getting the instructions into them, all that stuff takes an incredibly long time. So when you turn off something this large, you can spend a really, really long time starting it up again. But the benefit here, if you actually turn off the power to it, you don't just stop the clock like we talked about up here, you actually turn off the power, then you don't have any leakage. And that's why you have this huge transistor here. So you can turn off the power and get rid of all the leakage and the dynamic power from the core. But the trade-off is you do have to have a huge transistor because when it's turned on, you need to put a lot of current through that transistor to power the whole core. Another example that's sort of in between is adjusting the clock duty cycle. So you could say every time we have a clock go through, every other one I'm going to turn it off. And so that just means that you only process things on every other clock signal. And this means there's a lot less switching, so it reduces dynamic power, and it doesn't take extra time to switch back. So you haven't shut anything off, you've just killed a few clock signals, and you can stop killing them to get up to full performance. So let's take a look at an example of these sorts of trade-offs, and that's looking at trading off latency versus energy in a cache. So here's a traditional cache. It's four-way. We've got four sets of tags and four sets of data. We're going to take in our address. We're going to put the address into data and into the tags. It's going to find some entries here, so it's going to read out all the tags. We're going to compare all of them, and we're going to find one that matches. Now at the same time, we're going to read out all of the data for that index, and then we're going to use the tag to select the one data that we want. So this is great. We read out our tags and our data at the same time, and then at the very end we select the data we want. So it's a parallel readout, and it only takes one cycle. The problem here is we've read this line, this line, and this line. We've read three lines that we don't want. Imagine if this was an eight-way cache. We would have just read seven lines that we don't want. So we're spending a lot of power to read out things we know we're not going to need. The other way to do this is to not do it in parallel. So in the first cycle, we're going to go into our tag array. We're going to read out and find out what we want. Then in the second cycle, we're going to take the knowledge of what we want, plus the address, and go into the data array. Now we read only the part we want. We read out one item. So this is what's known as a phased cache. So it takes two cycles, one cycle to figure out which way we want, and then the second cycle we read out the way, but it uses much less energy. And the trade-off here for an eight-way cache is about a 5% loss in performance from adding that extra cycle to your L1 cache, and a 40% decrease in L1 energy. So 40% decrease in cache energy is a very significant decrease, but realistically this loss in performance is a big problem for a lot of, a lot of processor designs. So there are more clever ways to do this that involve uh, being clever about when you access these things in which order so that you can basically fit them into the same cycle. All right, let's look at another option here which is specializing the architecture for the application. Again, this is to save power. So here's an example of saving power in H.264 video encoding from doing customization. And here we see five steps, or four steps of the encoding. This is the integer motion estimation. This is a fractional motion estimation. Here you're doing prediction. Here you're doing the numeric encoding. And then this is the total. We're looking at the energy consumption. The first bar here shows you what it takes if you run on a regular processor. The second part here, these red ones, show you what happens if you add in SIMD and special instructions and merge instructions together. So this is basically customizing the processor instructions for what you're trying to do. And what you see is by using these custom instructions, you get about a 10x savings. We get a 10x savings everywhere except for here. So this numeric encoding is completely serial. There's nothing you can do in terms of these wider instructions to speed it up. So if you have custom instructions, you can get about 10x savings over what you get with a regular processor. Now in this paper, they went and looked at magic, and this is basically building special parts of the processor to handle things. I'm going to skip this for now and go straight to the last one here. So the last one is if you did a full custom design. 
So the full custom design gets even dramatically more savings. So if you look at how much more savings this is, 100x better savings than having these custom instructions. So what this results here show you is that if you have custom instructions in your processor, you can get about 10x savings in energy, but that's really small compared to the 1,000x savings you get from custom hardware. So this is telling you you're paying a really big price for the programmability of a processor in terms of the energy efficiency. You can look at another example here. This is improving search through customized hardware. So they basically took an FPGA, compared it to a bunch of servers, and what they said was that for the same latency, you can get about double the throughput. So the FPGAs were enormously more efficient at getting throughput. And the other thing that's neat here is they're running 200 megahertz FPGAs versus processors running at over 2 gigahertz. And they still saw twice the throughput improvement. Very impressive results. All right, so the specialization results there were very impressive. Phenomenally better job, but what's the catch? Well, the catch is that specialization is difficult and inflexible. You can specialize for every algorithm. And it's just going to be a lot of work. The real problem is that it's hard to do. So let's take a look at what they required. So for speeding up that search, they had to design a custom processor core for their FPGAs, and they had to build a custom compiler to compile to that processor core. So here's the picture of their processor core. They made a multi-core processor, had a bunch of clusters. Each cluster had six custom cores on it. They had to define f special functional units for this. So they had to design all of this in order to be able to make the FPGA run efficiently. If we look at the H.264 speedup results, they had to design custom instructions, and they had to get the compiler to use them. So they had to change the compiler and figure out what were the right instructions in order to do that. And then for the final one, for the custom version, they had to design the whole thing in hardware. So they had to go and build it. So the takeaway message here is that general purpose processors provide a flexibility that is worth an enormous amount for building things, but it also costs an enormous amount in terms of energy efficiency. All right, let's talk about some runtime optimizations. And the biggest one here is adjusting the clock speed. So we can reduce the clock speed to something we can tolerate. So if you're watching a movie, you can turn the clock speed all the way down until the movie starts to skip frames. If you're running a web server, you can turn the clock speed all the way down until your customers start to complain that it's taking too long. So the benefit of this, if we're at a low clock speed, we don't need fast circuits. And if we don't need fast circuits, that means we can reduce the voltage. Remember, when we reduce the voltage, the transistors run slowly. And this is what's known as DVFS, or dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. The idea is very simple. Find the lowest frequency for the program, and then choose the lowest voltage that supports that frequency. So we're going to get a lot of savings here. We're reducing the frequency and the voltage. So how much of a savings do we get? So what happens if we cut the frequency and voltage in half with DVFS? Well, we get a tremendous benefit. We get the power down by 8x, and the program only takes twice as long. Remember our power equation here. V is squared and F. So we get a squared effect from the voltage plus a linear effect from the frequency. But the program performance only goes down linearly. So this is a great trade-off. We get a linear performance decrease for a cubic power trade-off. So this is really nice. This means we're getting a really nice benefit. There's only one little problem. The range of voltages is going down. So if we can't change the voltage much, we're not going to get this really good benefit that we expect. So let's take a look at this. Here's an example of how the voltage range of DVFS has been going down over the years. You can see in 1998 it was pretty large, and it's getting smaller and smaller. The problem here is really that we can't get below this magic 0.6 volts. That's the threshold voltage of transistors, and when you get below them, they're in sort of a mixed on-off state, so they don't work very well. The problem is that most of the benefit comes from this V squared effect, and if we can't adjust V anymore, we're not going to get much benefit. So if the voltage goes away, we get a linear slowdown for linear power savings. That's not a trade-off most people are willing to make. Most people really like their performance. So I mentioned here that you can't go below 0.6 volts, and that's more or less true. If you go below 0.6 volts, you have what's known as sub-threshold operation, and you can build circuits there, but they're very different. The people who've built threshold circuits here are usually running at kilohertz, not even megahertz, but they do operate very, very energy efficiently. So for modern processors, this is not really practical, but there are interesting designs for that. So this brings up a very interesting question. What does DVFS do if we can't keep changing the voltage? So if we get to the point where we have a very limited voltage range, what becomes the point of DVFS and how do we take advantage of it? And we're going to talk about this some in class.